Today I'm going to talk about industrial infrastructure policies, and it's such an enormous topic. Um, I'm going to do little more than scratch the surface. And in some sense, that I think is also my criticism of government policy in the post-war period towards industrial infrastructure policies. I think they have barely scratched the surface. I don't think we've had a particularly consistent set of policies towards industry and infrastructure. And I shall try to give some ideas as to why that might be and talk a little bit about the consequences um, of those choices for the state of the economy. As you'll know, this is the fifth of a series of six lectures about the state of the economy as we head out of the European Union into the next decade. And so what I want to do is set a precursor, I think, for the final lecture in June, where I'll bring together some of the ideas and come up with some form of blueprint. Those are the kind of things that we might need. But I'm glad you're able to join me this evening on this journey as we go through some of the outcomes for the British economy for what I think has been a poorly addressed supply-side set of policies. Um, before going on, I want to thank very much the work of, of um, economic historians Peter Matthias, um, who passed away a couple of years ago, but also Nick Crafts, whose insights have been very helpful to me in thinking about some of these issues, and also colleagues at the National Institute who provided some simulations for me to uh, talk about. Um, I, I won't be talking about them in great detail, so don't head for the door just because I've mentioned simulations, but we'll have a look later on uh, as to what uh, we're able to do. So the first thing I want to uh, draw attention to is a very famous book by Peter Matthias on the first industrial nation, written um, slightly under 50 years ago. And I think it was incredibly influential in thinking about an approach to industrial or infrastructure policies. And, and Peter, in writing the book, was describing the first industrial nation, which was Britain, and thinking about how it industrialized first why it industrialised first, and also to an extent what government policies were adopted at this time. And his point of view, which is worth, I think, repeating, is that industrialisation in Britain from at least the mid-18th century onwards is taken as the classical case of spontaneous growth. So not something that's directed or planned in the sense in which we now understand it to be, and we may see in other parts of the world as a planned process. That was not what was going on. And to be fair and in context, Clearly, government in the 18th century was much, a much smaller beast than we have today, and the idea of planning would be an almost anachronistic to accept government, to expect governments to be planning at this time. It's not something that was typically done. But nevertheless, the insight that this was spontaneous and responsive primarily to market influences, so that means the price mechanism and the expectation of profit, that's, I hope, in the City of London, not unpleasant phrases to use, but this was very much the view about where um, industrialization came from. Primary to market influences and, and underlying social institutional forms not organized consciously by government design in the interests of promoting industrial growth. So no sense was it a strategy, but I think more importantly, this point, I think in the sense of Keynes point about academic scribblers, has been sitting at the back of lots of policymakers' minds in the intervening 50 years as the British way of doing it. No need to plan, it'll happen spontaneously. And I think it's been influential as a piece of insight I don't take issue with, but its influence may have gone far beyond uh, just a simple description of the 18th century. And he went on uh, in the book to say, industrialization being the it was not the result of deliberate government policy sponsoring industrial progress, the state did very little to promote industrial innovation as an act of policy, to stimulate productive investment, to mobilize capital for productive investment, whether directly or by way of tax revenues or indirectly by guaranteeing the rate of return on capital raised by the market or offsetting risks faced by the market. Think of the PFI, for example, as something that might be all about that kind of problem. It did not conduct enterprise did uh, not set out to attract foreign capital or skills. It was reluctant to accept responsibility for social investment um, and, also did not, uh, and also was reluctant to establish the usual infrastructure. The state was almost entirely independent um, of the issues of industrial and infrastructure policy that occupy so much of our time 
today as we think about what we might do to address the problems that we perceive in the UK economy. Let me go on in, in at least economic history time, if not uh, the time at which these things were written. This is a, a book which I've referenced before in my lectures, on the management of the British economy, written by, by J.C.R. Dow, who was deputy director of the Institute um, when he wrote this. Um, and he makes a different kind of point, describing the immediate post-war British economy. And he says, right, the major fluctuations in the rate of growth of demand and output in the years after 1952 were thus chiefly due to government policy. So it was government policy itself that was leading to fluctuation in the economy, very much about government stabilisation policy trying to stop the economy from having excessive stop-go cycles. But in fact, these policies were implemented in such a way as they tended to exacerbate the economic cycles, he argues. And he said, goes on to write, it must be supposed policy went further than intended, as in turn did the correction of those effects. So as soon as you go a little bit further, think of the shower in the morning when you're trying to get the temperature just right. You turn it to the right and it seems cold, so you continue to turn it to the right and it gets too hot and then you turn it too far to the left and it gets too cold. Um, maybe that doesn't happen to you, but it still happens to me. Um, maybe you have better, better utilities where you are. Um, as far as internal conditions are concerned, then budgetary and monetary policy fail to be stabilizing and must, on the contrary, be regarded as having been positively destabilizing. This was a damning indictment of stabilization policies in the 1950s and 60s. But I think there's another deeper point to be made. If the main focus of the smart people in the Treasury and in government was on short-run policy, who was thinking about the long run? Who was thinking about the supply side? Who was creating the conditions for a reindustrialization of the economy and the rebuilding of infrastructure after the war? Now, clearly people were thinking about it, but were they thinking about it enough? Was this a case of diverting scarce policy resources to a more interesting area, which is monetary and stabilization in fiscal policy, rather than deeper, more complex issues to do the infrastructure and industry. And I suggest that may be one possibility for us to pursue. And of course, when we start to think about capacity, and this is um, some work the Institute did in the 1960s and 70s, one of the early attempts to understand what happens in an economy if the supply side, and that's what we're really talking about today, the ability of the economy to uh, produce capacity uh, and produce goods and services. Of course, those goods and services will lead to income and lead to expenditure, but we won't talk so much about the expenditure or demand side today. We're only interested in the supply side of the economy. Um, and that the, the um, undotted line the, 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 the shows you the actual level of output in the British economy from 1951 through to 1962, and the dotted line is an attempt to measure capacity. And if you look at it hard enough, you can see it's not a straight line. There's some movement in it over the business cycle. And this is an attempt by Wynne Godley and his uh, co-author, Shepard, to think about how the productive capacity may move over time and with the economic cycle. It's one of the early attempts to get at that. And in fact, people went further in the 80s and 90s to almost suggest that the whole of the fluctuation in output was all to do with changes in the supply side of the economy. That's probably going a little bit too far. But the point I want to make is that the long-run increase and in augmentation of income and income per head is nearly entirely determined by the evolution of the supply side of the economy. The demand side essentially follows it. Demand side can perturbate around it, but it's the supply side that matters. So the critical question is how we build the supply side of the economy. And you'll remember, if you come to earlier lectures, the supply side in the most simple terms possible, comprises three elements. The quantity of labor in the economy, the capital stock, and if we add to that a notion of total factor productivity, that is, if we combine these two items and we add in how productive we are, overall we get some measure of output in the economy at its productive full price capacity. And so later on we can see this measure of productivity, this is one particular measure, and that's the amount of value added in the economy we're, we're producing per person employed. And I'm just showing this because the Institute's been looking at these things for a very long time. 
And the pictures are unfortunately very similar over time. And this is a, this is a comparison of the UK with some of our European neighbors. Um, we can uh, see, I'll just make it absolutely clear which one is uh, the, the UK. This one here. And um, you see in 1955, with this index, with the UK uh, at 100 in 1970, was it around 70 15 years earlier? Another five years uh, later was around 110. But what you can also see in the nature of this scale is that other countries tended to be growing their productivity at a faster rate. And this is an aggregate number across the whole economy. The aggregate number, of course, is adding up all the regions and giving us an aggregate picture. I'll come to the regional decomposition or the spatial dimension of this a little bit later on in this talk. But the key thing for an, an economist here, or any of us really, are the slopes. Because this slope is telling us the rate of growth over time. And this, it's this rate of growth that determines the value added per person and probably the amount of income per person in the economy at any moment in time. And the, by far away, the flattest, so the worst performance in terms of growth, is the UK. And this is going back 55 to 75. It's not a new phenomenon. Um, this predates joining the EEC. <laughs> it's a very, very old phenomenon in the UK that this has not been addressed. But let me not be accused of selecting time periods to make my point. I can look at GDP per hour work. This is data from the OECD. Um, and we're looking here at U USD as US dollars, constant prices 2010. And this is the amount of GDP we're producing per hour that we work. So the average in the G6 in 2010 is around $50 per hour worked. And that's a lot of data to get to that number, but we'll take the OECD's estimates as um, something we believe, rather than saying these are ones that we're going to cast some doubt on. And at that same point, you can see the UK is in about the 40s, and if we look at the euro area at 2010, it's a little bit below that. But the clear pattern is there. At, if we look at the average in this fairly long 45-year period, the UK has almost in constant terms been below the level of productivity of the other G6 nations, which means that those that were ahead of us in income per terms 45 years ago have gone even further ahead, and those that were behind us have tended to catch up and go beyond us. And if we look from the mid-1990s onwards, um, in a period I've called in my own work the long expansion from 1992 to 2007, you can see the UK pulled away from the average that we see in the euro area. Uh, and in fact, seemed to be approaching the G6 average by about the time of the financial crisis. So it was a relatively good period of performance um, compared to our trading partners. But um, sadly, in some sense, following the financial crisis, uh, we've seen that our performance has, in relative terms, deteriorated. And we're now back to about the average of the euro area alone. That's 16 or 17 uh, countries rather than just the main Western European ones. And again, so that tells us our average or aggregate level of productivity, the amount of output we produce per head across the whole country, um, is on average less than our G7, G6 trading partners and not much better than the whole of the euro area. Let's try and go a little bit further than that. I talked about the things that determine supply as being the level of labor in the economy, the level of capital, and total factor productivity. Let me look now at investment, which is essentially the derivative of capital. As we invest, and investment stays in the economy, that, that adds to the capital stock. You see the UK, in terms of investment relative to GDP, um, is sadly uh, at the bottom of, of, of the G6. Now, that may be fine if we had a very efficient form of investment. If every unit that we invested was more efficient than that in our trading partners, we would have a higher <coughs> capital stock over time. But we don't. There's no reason to suppose the unit 
that we invest in the UK is any more efficient than it is in the other economies. And certainly the levels of income per head or indeed productivity would also back up that conjecture. Um, and so, yes, you know, Japan started 20 odd years ago with very high levels of investment, possibly even overinvestment. And the contraction of the economy over that period has been a movement down from a too high level of capital to a lower level of capital. So the Japanese experience is to some extent uh, distorting your, your view of that chart. What we can see is the UK level of investment has been low and continued to be low over this very long period. Let me go further. Investment is public and private. And let's just have a look at the public sector alone. Again, these are average numbers. I'm not looking at the region at this stage, and we'll get there shortly with a story as what all of this means at the regional level. Public investment, that's the stuff the government does that the rest of the country can't. Defence, health, bridges, roads, all that kind of thing. Um, in, the, in the 25 or 26 year period since 1990, has hovered around 3%. Remember I talked about that period of catch-up in productivity from about 1995 to 2005. And without doing any heavyweight econometric statistical analysis here, you can see that that period of catch-up, at least no less than it is coincidental with this increase in public investment from 1995 to about 2005. So public investment may have powerful what economists call uh, spillovers or multiplier effects for the rest of the economy, particularly if it's doing things that the private sector can't do. I go back to the questions of roads and bridges uh, and, and hospitals and other areas. So it could very well be the case, and a lot of literature suggests that public investment, if appropriately thought through, so we avoid the white elephant problem, may have an important role in building up the capital stock and uh, to some degree, the level of productivity in the economy. So even though the level of public investment we now see is about the medium-term average, it has been declining since the start of the financial crisis, and that is a cause, I think, for concern. I have a look at another aspect of, of the economy, and that's re research and development expenditure relative to GDP. Now, given the story I'm telling you so far, you're probably not surprised by this either. So I'm building up a, a rather damning picture of, of where we are, and we've talked about the intellectual antecedents, and we've talked about the focus on short-run policy, and we're looking at the consequences of that as a result of productivity, investment, the level of capital stock. And you'll know from previous lectures, I've pointed at least a partial finger to the operation of the financial sector as well but I'll leave you to look at the lecture on that in your own time. But research and development expenditure has been shown, and this is both public and private, it's not only public research and de uh, development expenditure, has also been shown by much research to have important consequences for the level of income over time. You see the UK uh, in the 30-year period since the mid-1980s is not achieving, on average, the levels of expenditure in research and development that we're seeing in G6 economies, and I think that's another cause for um, concern. So what's the summary so far? It's rather depressing on this glorious day. Um, third factor of productivity is low. Our capital stock seems to be low as a result of low levels of investment. Our public investment may well be low, and our R&D may well be low. I'm not actually telling you anything particularly about a model. I'm not telling you what Economists may call K-star or I-star what the appropriate levels are. I'm just making some simple observations based upon the data that's in front of us. I could um, do something more, but I, I think this, these kinds of results will come out from all kinds of analyses as well. So let's go a little bit further now into uh, what we might call the number of post-war errors that undermined uh, the industrial and infrastructure policy that we see. The next few slides I draw heavily on work by Nick Cross, so I want to thank him uh, for all his insights. Um, and, and, and I think it's clear that supply-side policies can matter, but there need to be appropriate incentives to invest and innovate. And that's very much about tax, very much um, about a financial sector that's prepared to support innovation in particular form. But I'm, I'm using these words because I'm summarising a large amount of literature that seems to suggest that these kinds of results are appropriate. So we could make the statement that supply-side policies don't matter if we didn't find a role 
for investment or coordination, or policies that, uh, I'll come to a phrase later on, that's policies that allow firms to plan over the longer run. But consistently we find that these things do matter. What we had instead, as I've already said, is a concentration on short-run stabilization policies. And these were pursued, for those of you who remember, in a form of consensus, um, where there were income policies designed to promote full employment in cooperation with trade unions. Now, this may not have been a bad outcome in the post-war period. In earlier lectures, I've talked about the beverage report and the need to provide full employment and opportunities for people. And those kinds of issues are tremendously important and things that we shouldn't forget as we forge a new economy. But to the extent to which public resources or public, public minds, public thought was concentrated on those questions, we may have avoided the longer run structural questions that I want to talk about today, or have been talking about today. As a result, we can point to contributory negligence in taxation, particularly taxation of capital returns, and perhaps in, at times inappropriately high levels of income taxation as, as well, which worked against incentives to innovate and invest. Despite trade union cooperation, industrial relations in this immediate post-war period were not ideally what we would have wanted them to be. Let me not go any further. But many, many days were lost to strikes throughout this very long period, despite trade union cooperation over a full employment regime. Industrial policy for what it stood, I'll come on to that in my next slide, but itself, I think, was largely a letdown over this period. Forms of nationalization were essentially backward-looking to protect declining industries rather than forward-looking um, in terms of providing new industries with time to grow. And there was the specter of some form of protectionism itself, which I lost my glass of water, oh, there it is, which itself was not something that was helping uh, innovation in the way that we would want. So I think overall we can talk about an adverse impact either because of errors of commission or inter interaction with an institutional leg legacy, which was this consensus about labour and capital and trying to minimise disruption. And perhaps what the economy needed after the war was some disruption to bring about new practices and new um, methods of doing business. So what are the problems of industrial policy that I've alluded to? Well, I think historically, producers, those people that are out there producing manufacturing goods or whatever they're doing, are long-lived institutes with large amounts of resources, and they're in a position to lobby government in a particular way that consumers generally can't. And, and so what you'll have is other things being equal. This policy, if we're not careful, may be designed to support producers who are long-lived rather than new producers or new firms or consumers. And there's certainly an element of that industrial policy in the post-war period. And if there is going to be more lobbying by producers, which kind of firms will be lobbying? Well, it's going to be the older ones, often the ones that have suddenly started to become unprofitable. They're going to say, conditions have changed, we can no longer be profitable. Please, Mr. and Mrs. Government, can you help us please? If you don't mind, thank you very much, sir. And that's what I think we tended to see. Um, and those who are still winning are not going to look for subsidies or industrial support. They're going to say, we're fine. We don't need to spend our resources doing this. We will carry on with what we're doing. In fact, um, later on when we consider the financial sector, that might be exactly what we saw there as well. When it was making lots of money in the period up to 2007, it didn't want any interference by the government at all. But as soon as the um, uh, music stopped, uh, there was a tremendous amount of support from the government. So we might think about the financial sector as also an aspect of industrial policy uh, that reflected the paradigm that I'm talking about. So what do subsidies do? Well, to put it in very stark terms, it stops declining industries from dying. It sustains them, keeps them in operation, keeps their capital employed, keeps labour employed in firms that have low levels of productivity and may lead to what has now been called a zombie firm problem, but certainly wasn't called that in the immediate post-war period. And once politicians have got involved with a firm, they're going to be quite slow to admit their failures. Um, I wouldn't like to comment on the quality of politicians. They're, uh, they're very high in my esteem, of course. But um, 
when they have invested their own political capital in a firm, they may wish to continue to show it's been a great success, rather than saying, actually, this hasn't worked, I'm going to move away from it. And that's something we would tend to see once a political system gets involved in a firm, that support may remain far beyond its actual requirements in terms of the economy itself. And so what happened in the 1970s? Well, we saw exactly this, a bias towards providing subsidies uh, to industries that were in decline, some moves towards tariff protection for exactly those same types of industries, um, the subsidization of new high-tech companies um, in civil aircraft, computers, and nuclear power didn't work terribly well uh, in this period. And the subsidies that were made available for investment, as I think I've just shown, didn't actually help increase the level of investment or, as a result, increase the capital stock. So it didn't actually bring about its objective. It just led to a deadweight loss in government expenditures that were financed by future taxes that all of us in this room have to pay. But that said, amongst all the losers, perhaps helping Rolls-Royce was a success because in the end it managed to correct itself. So the difficulty here is choosing and deciding which interventions are going to work and which ones are going to fail. Um, that there was one success doesn't mean that the whole policy was necessarily a success. But that there was one success would also imply that um, it's not always right to say no. There may be circumstances in which you want to provide some support. And I suppose that's what makes political decision-making so hard. So what happened in Mrs. T's decade? We went from selective and individual firm type industrial policies, something more horizontal, to try and reform the whole industrial sector so that there would be, uh, it would be easier for industries to help themselves. But the, the concentration was very much on the strengthening of competition where possible, development of all kinds of monopolies and mergers commissions and competition policy that would improve the lot for consumers by reducing monopoly power where possible. That was the idea. There were, of course, a number of industrial relations reforms, an extensive program of privatization, movement away from state ownership of firms towards uh, their, their, their ownership by uh, the private sector, some restructure, restructuring of taxation, uh, with more emphasis on indirect taxation and simplification of income tax, fewer income tax uh, bans, and the benefit to wage ratios were reduced, in principle making it more, more attractive to enter the labour market. Um, and, and so we can see the policies that were implemented in that decade were very much about moving away from support for producers to more opportunities for consumers and it to encourage the participation of workers in the workforce. A very different form of supply-side policies than just supporting firms that were already in existence. But the programme was not complete. Tax reform was incomplete. We didn't properly consider wealth, property and local taxes. Indeed, our attempt at property and local taxes, the poll tax, uh, didn't end very well at all. Uh, it was an attempt. It was a fundamental underspend on infrastructure. I think the quality of state further and university education was not particularly well addressed in this period. The increase in tertiary education happened much later on and arguably might have been concentrated in the wrong form of tertiary education. I think we're still suffering from a lack of reform in land use planning in the UK, but all of these reforms did not address an endemic problem of short-termism, short-term planning, either by industry or by financial markets. That rails against the development of industry and infrastructure. Short-termism seems to continue to be a problem. Um, and so what happened in the next period, the early 90s through to the period prior to the crisis? It was a reasonable performance that I've already outlined, as a in part as a result of those reforms I've just outlined for the supply side. But the performance in that period was reasonable rather than outstanding. And the expansion that we did had, have in 1992 to 2007 
did not seem to be sustaining insofar as what's happened subsequently is that we've gone sideways as an economy. So clearly the reforms that we had were not sufficient to bring about robust growth in the economy. We have some supply-side reform with flexible labour markets, and the flexible labour markets were very helpful in the period after the recession, so it meant that people showed real wage flexibility and the participation in the labour market meant alongside low interest rates, we didn't see very large-scale defaults on uh, housing mortgages, that people were continued to be able to pay their loans, which it may have seemed like a very large shock to the economy in 2007 8 but had we had much higher levels of unemployment without the real wage flexibility that we saw, I'm pretty sure that the size of the shock would have been larger and even more persistent. Very difficult to prove, but I'm just suggesting it to you as a clear possibility. So what was good? Competition regulation has been good. Education taxation still need reform. Innovation policy continues to be disappointing. And infrastructure policy and land use planning has continued to be poor. Um, in the period prior to the financial crisis, as I've already said, our large and, may I just say, under-regulated financial sector seemed to contribute a lot to that period. A lot of what it might have been doing was simply recycling savings from abroad in a fairly simple manner back to people who had collateral in their housing. Um, and subsequently, we've discovered that that sector was not sufficiently well regulated. That's a question for another time. What has this all meant for the state of the economy? Well, on average, as I've said, productivity and income per head has not performed very well in the UK over the long run and over the most recent period um, compared to other advanced economies and our G6 neighbours. And also, significant regional heterogeneity in outcomes. If we look at the average gross value added, GVE, gross values, that's the amount of uh, extra output you produce compared to the costs of your inputs in your economy. If we normalize that to 100, if we look at the regional level, only London and the Southeast outperform the average. And we can see that areas such as Wales are as, as low as 70% of the national average. So whatever performance we've had, either has been poorly distributed across the economy, or, and I think this is another part, important part of the prospect of, of the um, underlying causes, because we haven't thought hard enough about creating opportunities across the country, that has tended to drag the average down. And I think that's a critical part of uh, the case that we'd want to make here, is to think about how we can get uh, these places being more productive. But the story even here at the regional level is more complicated. We can look at cities. Uh, we can look at city areas or we can look at regions uh, within the areas that I've just described. And in every part of the UK where the average region is below the UK average, we can still find pockets that are above the UK average. So Peterborough or in Cheshire or in Bristol or, or Manchester, as a region, their average productivity is below the average of the whole economy, but within there, there are pockets of very high productivity nevertheless. And so it's as much about thinking about how we can raise the regional productivity through um, developing the influence of these particular pockets of urban productivity that could raise the productivity of those areas as well. So at, at the national level, we're very much concentrated on London, and many people would argue London is an engine of productivity growth for the rest of the country, but there are clearly areas such as Edinburgh or Aberdeen, we know the reasons why, or Belfast, that could act as conduits for raising productivity in those regions as well. And that requires some thought as to how that can be the case. You need to direct activity towards those particular cities or urban areas within low productivity areas themselves. If we go further and um, try to understand what this all means in terms of the capital we have per employee, we see that that has actually been contracting since... 2011. So think again, I'm an employee, I want to produce a widget, 
How many widgets I can produce may depend upon the amount of capital I have available to me. If that's growing over time, I can, be more, uh, I can produce more widgets for every hour that I work. But actually, I'm seeing that it's contracting in this period. And that's also an important part of the problem facing the economy. How can we get more capital into employees' hands? Now, there is a lacuna to this point in the extent to which large amounts of capital may now be intangible. Think of the internet. Think of how that works. And it could be that we could be very productive without capital alone. But I think the stark reduction in capital um, employee, uh, capital available per employee, I think is part of the story. And if the capital again, I can't do this regionally at the moment, but if the capital again is, is, is concentrated in the southeast and in London, rather than being distributed throughout the country, you can see something else that's driving regional heterogeneity in performance. And if it's driving regional heterogeneity in performance, it may well be acting to drag down the average performance of the whole country. And, and, and so how can I convince you further that, that regional uh, outcomes matter for things that matter to us? Well, here on the x-axis, I'm, I'm plotting at the... Uh, nine UK regions, the increase in house prices in the nine UK regions over a 20-year period from 1996 to 2016. So you can see in one region, um, house prices in that period have gone up by 120%. What did the two axis represent? I, I was just going through that. So the x-axis is the... I'm sorry if I wasn't clear enough. I'll say it again. I, I've left it that way just so I would explain. So the x-axis is the cumulative increase in house prices since from 1996 to 2016 for the nine English planning regions. And the 120 corresponds to one region that I've mentioned a number of times. Would you like to guess which region it is? Comments of Greta? Yeah. Yeah. Barnard's in, yes, exactly. No, it, it, London, <laughs> London, clear. I, I won't mention the ones to the left. I don't want to embarrass anyone from that far. <laughs> on the, on the y-axis, I've simply taken that chart I showed earlier on of productivity and taken away 100 from all those numbers. So the, the number that's between 30 and 40 um, is London because it's 30 or 40% above the UK's average. And that's a snapshot of 2015. And so what we're able to see is, statistically at least, a pretty tight relationship in that the areas for which we seem to see high levels of productivity are also areas in which house prices have written, risen the most. Now, productivity may be very closely linked to wages, may be very closely linked to income, and therefore it's kind of saying that the supply of housing may be fixed, the extent to which we're feeling better off in those regions has driven up prices. But here's the rub, if I may borrow a phrase. Let's suppose every region had had the same level of productivity that there hadn't been this very large difference in productivity because of the allocation of capital, the allocation of labor, and the accrual of total factor of productivity, that we'd had policies to even these things out. And I'm just transferring all the things in the economy to the impact on house prices. So I've said many times in these lectures, as I go around the place, that's all, everyone, everyone, that's all anyone ever wants to talk to me about anyway. So I might as well just put everything into the filter of house prices. And, and you'd have this interesting result. Um, that if there'd been no difference in regional productivity, the zero line, and just to help you here, I mean, if everyone had the same level of productivity, this simple regression would be telling us that house prices across the country, on average, over that 20-year period, would have only gone up by 70%. And we wouldn't have the much larger differences that are creating barriers to mobility, and creating intergenerational barriers to people establishing their lives. So the, the point about regional heterogeneity matters, and the inability of infrastructure to even out these consequences matter for prices, which matters for wealth and matters for life chances. Let me go further. Here we have, on this axis, exactly the same numbers. That's the increase in house prices over a 20-year period in the nine UK, uh, uh, sorry, English regions. 
And, and here we have uh, an index of housing completions relative to the population in that region. So just to help you out, out what's going on here, is that in this particular region, where there were a lot of, where the number of house completions was almost the same as the change in population, it was almost one, house prices rose by the least amount. And in the areas where the completions were low relative to the increase in population, the increase in house prices was low, was highest. So what does that tell us? Tell us that policy, apropos completions, land use, construction, building of roads that helps those things to be completed, again, would have mitigated against the increase in house prices if it was done across the country. Uh, and in fact, one could almost say that if we'd, um, if you look at the nature of this, if we'd uh, built as many houses as the increase in population, actually there wouldn't have been any increase in house prices. It's very long <laughs> but I'm simply making another point, that infrastructure matters. The infrastructure would have changed the composition of house prices and reduced some of the rigidities in the way that the economy can move both at a moment in time, that's regional movement to where the jobs are, the location of firms becomes a lot easier in that world, and inter intergenerationally, how the next generation has to cope with the problems that it faces if these prices hadn't moved by that much. Let me go on. I, I don't want to make the case today, uh, I never would, that the whole of the problems that we face are all about the public sector. When we look at, this is a simple decomposition of research and development expenditure in, into uh, private and public, um, uh, essentially. And um, what, what I just want to say is that there's as much private as there is public um, in a sense in which if we look at this is, this is government and some of it is private non-profit, but they both matter. So if we think of worlds in which we're not arguing, I'm not arguing today that all R&D should be done by the private sector or all R&D should be done by the private sector. But R&D in total seems to matter. What we need uh, to think about are worlds in which both of them can work together. And of course, to some extent, the university sector may well be an area for that to be thought through. Um, fully. What is the overall, as a result of the quality of the infrastructure in the UK? Well, this is just a report for something called the Global Competitiveness uh, Report, and it looked at the G7 countries and said, what's the quality, uh, looking across all our infrastructure in the UK, compared to other G7 countries, and uh, sadly, we're in the bottom couple of countries. Uh, the index here I, I'm not con convinced completely that these numbers are significantly different from each other. But the perspective here is that the quality of our infrastructure is poor. And in line with the previous results, I think I'm trying to show that it has tangible and important benefits, uh, problems for the economy as a result. And improving the quality of our infrastructure would help economic outcomes. So what happens in an economy if we use government investment to increase um, infrastructure. Well, we're running some simple simulations here, which is uh, a 1% shock to government expenditure for a five-year period, and trying to understand the impact on output as a result. And these are different responses depending upon whether uh, the monetary authority interest rates rise um, or don't rise uh, in a particular uh, way. And, but what I want to kind of say is that what you see is that, in general, uh, the responses are not terribly large. For a 1% increase, you're seeing something smaller in every year than 1%. And this is what we find time and time again in aggregate data. You may remember a debate four or five years ago on the impact of extra government spending at the time of recession and whether every pound spent by the government would have more than one pound impact on the economy, the so-called and famous multiplier. But when you run these kinds of simulations, you don't see those kinds of reactions. And I think there are two uh, reasons for that. One is 
typically models such as this are already working at close to full capacity. So the extra investment doesn't lead to any form of supply side response. We have to ask ourselves, can we understand what would happen to the supply side if the economy had sufficient slack in it? And that's one question. The other question is that most of these models and most of this work is constructed on aggregate data. And the aggregate data often washes out, doesn't allow us to see what happens in particular regions when they themselves may be or may have sufficient capacity available to them. To the extent to which it washes itself out, we're underestimating the possible impact on um, supply. And so what we need, and we don't particularly have at the moment, are ways of understanding the regional multipliers and understanding how overall capacity may respond to such government shocks when there is a lot of spare capacity in the economy. So these are two things that I think, even though the, the simulations do suggest significant impacts, particularly if interest rates don't change, these are the largest impacts here, this pink line here, and this overall shows some significant effects, but they're not large enough to make the case compared to the actual cost of the investment. So I think there are some limits to the modeling that we currently have available to us. More regional modeling and more ability to understand slack in the economy. And so when we look at the infrastructure pipeline that's out there, um, a pipeline of planned investment from the National Infrastructure Commission looks, looks high in terms of transport and energy. And also post-21, there seem to be a lot of plans for infrastructure expenditure. Uh, and our question is whether these will take us back to the levels we should be at. Um, it looks like it's very much skewed towards transport, energy, and utilities, and very few commitments in the medium term to science and research, housing and regeneration, health um, and education. Seem to be pretty profound gaps in the plans in the immediate period. So there still seems to be some lack of attention to those areas when we look at the plans published by the National Infrastructure Commission. And furthermore, if we look at public spending on infrastructure by country and region, in the four or five years in the first part of this decade, um, at about £3,000 over that period, it's not far above what we, pe what we get from the NHS per person per year. So it looks relatively low. I'm not going to give you any metrics here, and I'm not going to make a case for how much needs to be done. Simply making the case that it looks low. And what I also see is that to what extent is this re reinforcing or offsetting the regional differences that I've talked about in earlier on? The largest slug per head is going to London, which is already ahead of everywhere else. But we're seeing uh, more perhaps being sent to Scotland, Northern Ireland and Wales, which were behind the average. So the, the extent to which this policy may be offsetting or, or amplifying differences is not clear to me at the moment. We can split that same number by economic uh, and social expenditure. And we see that a large amount of what's going to um, the regions, Scotland, or the Celtic regions, Scotland, Northern Ireland, and Wales is very much more social than economic. So it may not be helping their economies over the very long run, uh, more concentrated on social issues. So I think there are some clear questions there as the way to which public expenditure is, or public spending on infrastructure is going to be allocated across our regions as we move ahead. And so to conclude, the case I'm trying to make for, the, for Britain has been persistent and chronic productivity failures that I think are both national and regional. In theory, in the kind of spontaneous theory that many of us have at the back of our mind. Um, we may think that recessions create spare capacity and a chance to reallocate factors to new industries and new innovations that will provide dynamism into the future. But the regional performance suggests that that is not what has gone on since the start of the financial crisis or necessarily in the post-war period. It may well have been reinforcing differences in productivity. There may be some need to coordinate some of the action to allow resources to catch up in those areas. 
And as a consequence, we see substantial differences across firms, regions, and sectors, which are manifest in things such as the allocation of FDI and house prices. And it's something that needs to be addressed. And indeed, times may even be worse. Our high growth industries in the long expansion, financial services, telecoms, and some manufacturing industries, um, are no longer supporting ag aggregate productivity growth since the start of the financial crisis. So the things that helped us catch up since the, from the mid-90s to the mid-noughties are no longer helping us anymore. They seem to have possibly hit their own capacity constraints or are suffering from a lack of, or chronic lack of infrastructure expenditure. So the issues that need to be addressed. Overall, the subdued demand in the economy, lack of confidence in the economy, um, a banking system that's in a period of retrenchment and reform itself, maybe adding to these constraints and making firms less dynamic than we'd otherwise or prefer them to be. So this seems to me to be a first order case for the government to pick up this problem by the scruff of its neck and try and attack it. I'm not convinced that we have done so yet. And so I'm concerned and I'm sorry to uh, you know, cause you to be concerned about the future on such a glorious day, but at, at the bottom of a pint of beer, things never seem quite so bad, I find. But it's tempting to remember Yeats and that things can fall apart if we're not very careful. Turning and turning in the widening gear, the falcon cannot hear the falconer, things fall apart, the centre cannot hold, mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. Let's hope that doesn't happen. But I'm concerned that time and time again we haven't addressed these structural deep issues that the regional economy needs thought, careful thought and design, and if we don't do so, uh, don't act upon these things, we may find the economy continuing its relative decline at a late rate that would alarm us. Thank you very much.